Hello, welcome to this session about context capture and a processing workflow. My name is Mark Rietman, I'm a consultant in the reality modeling and mapping team from Bentley Systems and I'm based in Brisbane, Australia. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about a little bit about the georeferencing, what's the standard workflow from images in to the reality model out, uh, talking about QR codes and constraints on so data set with no georeferencing and a retouch workflow cleaning up the data. Georeferencing. So what's important first that you understand the quality of your GPS, what you're using. So most of the drones have a GPS on board and the quality of this GPS, the standard GPS is not so great. So if you open the properties from the image and when you import the data, we see that you get a coordinate and a location. But the standard GPS is not so accurate. So it is possible that you fly, that you maybe in the afternoon the next morning fly again, and that you have completely different uh, corners, especially in the Z value. So that's important that you understand before you start processing, because we have some settings where we can handle that. Um, so most of the time what we see now in more uh, advanced drones they have an RTK on PPK on board and I'm not going too much in detail about the difference and what it is but what you get is a more accurate position of the image and in that case we need to know that because we can uh, we have some settings in context capture and process where you say okay the, the image location is really correct and we're not going to adjust it If you don't have an accurate position or you don't have any GPS at all, then often we see the users are using control points. So I'm not going to do in this session uh, processing data set with control points, but that's something you need to keep in mind. That let's say you have an, an standard GPS that you probably can adjust uh, the georeferencing and scaling on the model with using ground control points. But we can also do not georeference model, and with, in that we can scale it if we want. We, we can measure distance to certain points, and we can use that for scaling, or we can, uh, if the model's upside down or something, we can uh, change that. But we can still process not georeference models. That's no problem. The standard workflow. So the, the workflow with that in context caption, I'm going to go in in a minute explaining which applications we're using. You open a new project, you import your photos or your video or your point cloud or data or a combination of them. We run a process we call aerial triangulation. Where we're stitching all the images together. Once that is done, we go in a reconstruction and in the reconstruction you start producing the model. Uh, so creating a new project, import the photos, uh, in this case the photos, then we run an aerial triangulation and we have some settings in that, uh, For depends on what type of data you're, uh, you're using. When, we ha when we're happy with the result, we go to a reconstruction and start producing the model with a different type of formats. So, Let's, uh, I've got a small data set here, so let's open a data set here, so let me go, there's images, so I open the images so you can see what it is, it opens on a different screen, but you see here a building near a university and you can already see a little bit how we capture it. If I check the properties, so file info, we can see there is a coordinate. So there's a coordinate from this photo position, so we can use that. And we go back. Uh, context Capture itself, uh, we have three applications. So we have the Context Capture Master, Context Capture Engine, and the Context Capture Viewer. The viewer is also available as a free viewer. So the Context Capture Master, that's the one where we do all the creating project, importing images. And the engine is the one that does the work. And the reason that we split it up that we can we have applications or bigger users who do more processing who have multiple computers with multiple engines who are looking to the job queue and start processing. 
What is interesting, if you start with a new computer or you use it for the first time, in context capture settings, you, so that comes with installation. In the configuration folder we have here an option to do a GPU benchmark. So th this type of software is really hardware dependent. So we need a high clock speed CPU for the reconstruction part of the model and a really good graphic card, gaming graphic card, something like this. So I score 175. Um, if it says that your GPU is not compatible with AI, then you have to probably apply or update your driver. Okay, so let's start processing. So what I do is I open the context caption master and let's start creating a new project. So it's important that you have enough disk space because these projects are getting really big. So the interface of context caption master, I create a new project. Um, it's called, I got already the building, but let's call it, create a new project, uh, building zero one, something like it. So create a project in this folder. And I also create an empty block. So this is the, the interface you see there's an, uh, Workflow manager, so everything is still orange because I didn't import any data. I got my block here created. I can rename this block if I want, so I can give it another name, but I, I leave it like it is. And in this block, we import the images. Go a little bit about further what we can do in this uh, in the context caption master. We can Having job queue, so we're writing jobs to uh, a job queue. So you see, it's no engine running, no pending jobs, no running jobs. If I, um, we can create QR codes and targets, and later when we're gonna process a model that's not geo reference, we have some QR codes in there, so I can explain that. But what had happened if you do, for example, April tax, and let's say create one. I can open that folder and it comes on this screen. Sorry for that. I, if I now open it, I can print this out. And then the software, when you start uh, running aerial triangulation, we can tell them, look for QR codes of April tags and, and find this. So you don't have to manual assign them anymore. Uh, that's besides that. But, and what's important also, we have an, camera database. So if you uh, add images based on metadata, we, we load uh, camera properties from this database. You can create your own different ways of doing that. But uh, let's get started. So I go to photos and start importing my, my photos here. So I can do add photos, a selection set of a whole directory with the subdirectories. Let's go just browse to that folder and just I select them all. And the drone is in DJI Mavic Pro and you see it based on the camera, it automatically pick up the sensor size and the focal length. If I go now to my 3D view tab, I can see already the way we capture the images, something like this. So you don't see any tie points yet because we didn't do anything uh, processing yet. I can also, if I want to check where it is, I can export block and then select over here, Google Earth KML export and then open. So on my machine, it will open Google Earth and then it zooms into the location. So that can be useful because sometimes Let's say you do something with control points, uh, importing images location. You really want to know if you don't make a mistake. Um, let's see, it opens on another screen. So let's do it like this. So over here is the location. So let's close this one again. So the photos are now imported. The camera properties are reading, so you see here it's getting green. 
I can check the quality. So I got four gigapixels. So this the the, the data uh, data size for gigapixels. Um, in this photo set, what I can do, I can also import video. So if I have a video, I can import it here. Select the, uh, select the video file, where to start, where to stop. Uh, let's say the time between the frames. So every, let's say every second, you get a frame. Uh, we can remove photos, but you can also do it selected and do it from here. Um, we can set a down sampling, so we bring the quality down. So if you have a really high-end uh, camera and you just want to do something really simple or you want to do a quick model, you can bring the quality down, set a down sampling. We can check the images. Sometimes you, if you copy a lot of images, yeah, you maybe once in a while you need to check them if they're not getting corrupt. And if you have a more accurate position of these images, and that's often the case with a PPK data set, we can browse to a text file and load the image locations, the updated image location. I've got an, a point cloud. If I import a point cloud, I can do a static scanner or a mobile scanner. This is for tie points and control points, this, uh, this step. I'm going to do this in another session. And over here, we have some extra setting additional data. So context capture has a lot of settings and you will see when you start running the area triangulation that we have a lot of settings to set, but in general, the more generic type of is it's sufficient enough for normal data sets. So I can change the block type. I leave it in this case in generic, but for example, if I have an a cell tower and processing a cell tower, then I use this option all but around thin vertical structures. And then 3D view, we already discussed this. So the next step, what we're going to do is aerial triangulation. So I select the block here and I can do that on different ways. So I can do a right mouse aerial triangulation, submit aerial triangulation, or I select here, submit aerial triangulation. And then I select run it on the engine, not so much in the cloud. So I do here. So what you see here, what it says, we're creating a new block, block 180. That's good. And over here is important to understand the quality of your GPS. So what it says here, rigid registration, that's if your position is not really accurate. So that with the data set I have, it's it's a not RTK or PPK, it's not really accurate. So I use rigid registration. So we use the coordinates of the metadata. If you have, for example, an RTK on PPK data set, then you can use this option. But I don't have it, so I disable it. It's next. And then over here, we have a lot of different type of settings. And with a data set like this, normally we are keep all the settings as a standard. Sometimes I play with this key point density. So if you have buildings for your, or let's say you do buildings, we think it's not so much, not so many points where we can match the photos on or a cell tower or something like that. I keep it on key point density high. It takes a little bit longer, but it writes this information, the key points that are extracted in a project. So if every other AT where you do, if you use the same high settings, then it will skip that bit. Um, then we have here some more settings. If you have, for example, alternate engine is, if you have a lot of handheld images on top of each other, then alternate engine will really create a better result. Um, if you have good camera calibration, you can use this setting. So you could do that and everything springs to keep here. In this case, let's go to normal uh, default and I keep it on normal. And we have also, of course, to say we have also some presets where we ship with the product in an installation folder. Let's say you want to process a data set uh, capture with an, uh, let's say, with an iPhone. And quite often, what you see that the GPS is not accurate enough, and it will reject the GPS, and then you get a non georeference model. And then, for example, this do not check rigid registration. Uh, will work really well in that case. In this case, I keep it like it is. And what I do is I submit. And what you now see, and 
Yeah, normally I don't see that at all, but it say there is no engine listening to the job queue. That is because I didn't start an engine yet. So you have to start it separately. And what you see now, it will pick it up the job that is processing. This is normally something that you have always on. I just turned it off for this video, but this is something most of the time you just run. And now what you see, it's it's I had some internal processes. So the first 40% is extracting key points. And then it starts uh, comparing photos and, and so on and matching it together. So it's almost finished. What you can see during the process of area triangulation, it's already uh, comes up with a report, so you can already open the view report. Sometimes you will see that, yeah, it says, for example, all images are matched. Sometimes at the last moment, some of the images are getting rejected, but in this case, it looks okay. So still processing. If I now go to the project folder, so this is my project folder, you will see that in the project that, for example, the previews are loaded over here, uh, the key points are loaded over here. So these projects can become quite big. You can clean it up later if you want, but something to keep in mind that you have enough disk space. Okay, so you see now the area triangulation is finished. It says complete data is geo-referenced. We have a quality report. So you can select here and view the report. So over here, of course, the, the, the time, all the information about camera uh, uncertainties and so on. In the 3D view, is now the tie points are created. So tie points are the points that we use for uh, the yeah, creating the model later. So if I go on the right side over here, I got an option tie points. So what we do, tie points are hard to read. So if I put my tie points on, yeah, it's really hard to understand what you are creating. Um, that's why we have that splash option. So in this screen, and you can customize the screen a little bit, like if you don't want these images, you can say, I only want to do the uh, 3D view. Yeah. I like it to have them there, so I just uh, do this. What, what we see, we can select an image. So if I select here, this is selection filter is photo. So we can select an image here. We can view the direction how the image is taken and what the, the view direction is. Um, we can also display the report result, which is on the report. So for example, if I, let's say I turn it on and then we had here that option position uncertainties, you can turn that on and view, view it in here. If it's reading so you can see some of them a little bit more uncertain than other ones. So let's put the back the splash on and then can view it. So I'm quite happy with the result. Everything looks okay. You don't see any strange things. So you see a lot of noise outside here and you think, what is this? Where does it come from? That's probably because these images are shooting on an angle. So you see a lot of noise here, but we can also select from hey use tie point filter you select that point if it picks it up and they show which images viewing that so if i select here so let's do this image if i i can now view it the image location but i can do also uh open it you see in the back, this is probably what you see, this this uh, this objects here. That's probably the tie points that were created. And that's okay, because we cannot process the full bit. We only process what we really want to, pro what we need. So I go here. The, uh, if I'm happy with my area triangulation result, we're going to create a reconstruction. 
So we have an option here, 3D reconstruction. And what you see right away, it gives a warning about maximum RAM usage. If I go to my tab spatial framework, over there I can set the, the area of what I want to process. So I can, if I have a KML file, I can import it from here, but I can also adjust it manually. So if I do an option here, edit region of interest, I can make it smaller and do something like change the area I want to process. And uh, But what you see over here, it said an estimated RAM usage for one job, for a job, is 40 gig. 40 gig is too much. My machine is 32 gig. And we, we ex say you need to have tiles, jobs from max half of your available memory. So in my case, I have 32. So my job shouldn't be higher than 16. But even if you have way more memory, don't go higher than 25 or 28 gigabit RAM usage. And the way you, you set the tiling is over here. We have a tiling mode. We can do a regular mode. So let's say I do uh, 10 meter tiles. So each tile is, uh, it's still too big, it's 19, but yeah, you can see it over here. But let's say, uh, so uh, seven meters, something like this. Yeah. But we have also an option and we have volumetrics is basically the same, but in high, but another option is adaptive tiling. And we say each job should about 16 gigabit RAM expected usage. And then you see different type of tiles. So some tiles have more data and other have less data. So the tiling is set. Over here we can set uh, if we have constraints. Uh, that may be probably in another session where we're going to discuss this. Reference model is for if you want to clean up the data. And in processing settings, we can have some quality settings. And so let's say we keep normally the standard settings, but let's say you do want to do a really quick model, you can select medium. Um, I keep it on extra, keep everything the same. So I'm happy with this reconstruction. And now I can start producing the model. So right mouse, submit new production, give it a name. What do I want to export? So I can do a 3D mesh, 3D point cloud, auto photo, mesh for retouching, a reference model only, and also detecting what is water and flattened water. That's something we can do maybe in another session. So if I go to my 3D mesh, these are all my output formats. I got 3MX, 3SM Bentley formats, Cesium, web publishing format, S3, I3S for and some GIS users are using that. Uh, DGN, FBX for Autodesk applications, OBJ, Colada, uh, Open City Plan and Bentley application. So most common mesh formats are all in there. If I go back to, uh, and step what is in point cloud, we can export a last file and a and an, uh, bot file, Bentley format. And the last file we can also say we want a compressed version. You have to be careful a little bit. If you do one point per pixel, you get a really a, a huge data set. So sometimes you want to play with the settings to reduce the amount of data in the point cloud. And then we can do auto photo standards. We have different ways of doing this. This is in the, with this reconstruction, we have also a separate reconstruction for auto photos. Where you select, I want just my resolution, image size, and then what output format. But let's go back to the 3MX. So I do 3D mesh. I select 3MX. And what I want to show that a lot of these uh, different output formats had basically the same settings. So 3MX, for example, you can create a web-ready version. There's an, like, it comes with a small website where you can upload as a WebGL version and we can view it online. Um, but this setting, so for example, uh, the quality normally do 90%, uh, level of detail, I leave it like it is. But if I go, for example, to Cesium, 
we have basically that making a website is another option, is a CGM base application. But all these settings are all the same. So I don't have to explain every output format. So for example, FBX, they can only, yeah, this. they don't really work with level of detail. Um, so go back to 3MX, I keep all these standard settings as this and do next. And then over here, I set output coordinate system. So I we have all the standard coordinate systems. Also with height coordinates, if you want to use a uh, special height coordinate system. So this is in the Gold Coast, so it's 56. And I can say I want to do a uh, geode model or so 09. If you want this, this data, you ask me and I can provide you these files. You can also create your own coordinate systems. So, okay. Then the extent. So what I can do is I can select if I want to process certain tiles. Eh? I can say I only want to process this one and this one. Or I can, if I have a KML of a polygon file, I can use this and really cut down the mesh really nice on this polygon file. This is probably the best option then. And destination is output folder. So there's a well, normally in the project we have a production folder with all the models. So I do submit. And what you see now, it writes it to the job queue and start processing. So when the engine comes available, eh, so you can push a lot of jobs to the job queue. You don't have to wait till the job is finished. You can still, yeah. Uh, yeah, push it to the job queue and start processing. So uh, the engine picks it up and the job comes available. After the first tile, if the first tile is finished, you see an option here, uh, view and context capture viewer. The trick is, so the first time it will take a while, but all the other models, if you do it under the same production, goes faster. So now I said, let's say I want to do a cesium. I can go here, do uh, cesium tiles, uh, let's do this one again, can't change coordinate system, but oh, submit. And you will see that the first uh, will take a while for processing, and the second one goes way faster. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cancel these jobs, because I already pre-processed it, so to cancel, I can show you already the result. So, uh, yeah, I want to save it. So this is the result of processing. So after all the tiles are finished, I can open it in a viewer here. So two hours and 23 minutes, and there was four gigapixels. So that's uh, quite fast. And then this is the, the model that I have. So I can view it in 3D view, or I can open with context capture viewer. So the, the viewer what we explained before. Um, so two hours, 23 minutes. This is the cesium version. Uh, what is it? 21 minutes. And let's do open output directory. So you can see I already zipped it here, but so this is the data folder and this is the app folder and if you want to view the model locally so what you can do you can't open it in google chrome or uh, edge or maybe edge i'm not sure but i normally use firefox for it so there are some security settings that prevent uh, to open it in google chrome what what i normally use as a browser so this is the cesium viewer the basic viewer Um, yeah, so this is the standard workflow of processing. So there was this workflow, and now I want to do quickly a, another project, and that is an, a not geo reference model, and then we kind of use QR codes and constraints. And the workflow is basically create a new project. Same as before, import photos, run aerial triangulation. But during the aerial triangulation process, we 
select an option extract QR codes. And in that QR, so they will automatically uh, distract it and then have extracted. And then we can use a constraint. We run a new area simulation and then the model is scaled. And then you go the same as reconstruction and production. So let me go. But oh, so yeah. So over here we have the option extract QR codes. See, they will be created automatically. And then. Um, you can assign them. So in this model are three QR codes, so point number one, two, and three. And we'll measure the distance between one and three. So let's go to my screen. I create a new project. And uh, this may be just easier. Uh, let's say um, a QR project. QR coders project an empty block and I just start import the images. So this one is not geo referenced. So we just see. And what also would you notice the camera is not in the database. I got a special file uh, that comes with the, with the photos with the camera setting. So let's go here. I overwrite it. But what you see, the 3D view is not available because these images are not geo-referenced. So next step is submit area triangulation. I don't have any coordinate position, so I leave it like it is. But what I do here is I select target extraction and I know it's QR codes. Let's do the key point density high. Submit. And now we write this to the job queue. Engine picks it up. That's why I cancelled the other job before. And now it will match it, but it will automatically extract the key points from these images. Okay, the area triangulation is finished. You see a couple of photos cannot be used, but that's okay. And what it says is relative. So if I do now 3D view, what you see, the model is also upside down. So we're going to fix that. And these are the type points that are created one, two, and three. So if I, and let's go out of the block and back in the block, I go to my survey tab and let's go in and out again. It should be created here. So these are my type points. So type point number one, you see all the images that can see that point are now referenced in here. So this is number one. Number two was the one on the right top. And this is also something you can do manually. Eh? You can easily go in and, and assign a point. Eh? It doesn't matter really what it is as long as you can identify it. But this is a little bit more easier process. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to scale it. So if I go now to my 3D view and I do a measurement tool, distance, between number three and number one, it says so many units, eight units. Uh, units is nothing, so we don't know what it is. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna scale it. And this is one meter between these points. So I go to constraint and this is one and this is three, that's important. So I, I add a scale constraint between number one and number three. And I say it's one meter. Except, but you also notice that the model was upside down. And what I'm going to use, I'm going to use one to two as an x axis, and this is a positive y axis. So I'm going to add a new constraint, and we call that a plane constraint between number one and number two is my x axis, and number three is my positive. Y accept and now I'm going to run a new aerial triangulation so submit aerial triangulation and then over here I said use position constraint on user type points and let's go one step back I don't need to use all the photos only the one that I already used goes a little bit quicker uh, using all the constraints on user type points and then 
I already had high, I put high in again, so it doesn't extract these key points again. And this aerial triangulation should go faster because what you're going to do now, it skips the extracting um, key points because we already did it. And then the aerial triangulation should go a little bit faster. So now it's finished, but now you see it's absolute metric. And if I go to my 3D view, it looks okay. And now let's do a measurement to check uh -huh. between this one i didn't really select it correctly but you see it should be around oh it says two meters why oh i select the wrong point so between this one and something like this yeah it's a little bit i selected wrong but it should be around a meter and then we can go reconstruction and production of the model So the last part that I want to do in this session is retouch workflow. So the retouch workflow is removing some of the objects. So let's say you have some issues or some holes in your model. You can clean it up. So what you do, you do your normal reconstruction and normal production. And then you go in and you see some objects are, let's say, a little bit noisy or you want to clean up. You edit that tile. And then you update your production. And that edit and update, that is basically what you do from here. So let's go to that model that I already processed before. So that's not this one, but there is this uh, building one. And we have different ways of doing it. This is a way that I'm going to show how we do it inside Context Capture. But we can also do it with a third party application. So let's say in the model here, let's say this this object, this looks, this is from a tree, probably from the tree next there. We cut it out. Doesn't really look good, so I want to remove it. What often we do is sometimes you have under the model a little bit noise. Yeah, uh, you can delete, but for this one looks quite clean. But let's show the workflow of cleaning that object. So I go to my reconstruction. And then we have a reference model option here and we can select quality control. And then first I need to select which style of multiple tiles I want to change. So let's do select this one. So this is the one that I want to update. Um, I can add a tag or a description, but I leave it like this. It's automatically selected. And now I've got an option here, touch up tools. What we're going to do is I'm going to just do a simple select and delete. We can do a little bit more complex uh, closing holes, detecting small features and so, but that's maybe probably more for another session. Um, so I got my, my view here and what you see is a little bit, this is the bounding box. So it only affects what we do inside the bounding box and not outside the bounding box. But what I'm going to do is I can turn that off by over here. Select disable. This is the selection call. I leave it like it is. And now I can select that object. So what I want to do, is I can select this. So we have different selection methods. We can do a rectangle selection. And then the, uh, I can deselect by here or by control D. We have an, a selection with like a paintbrush uh, with different sizes of the, the selector. So you do something like this and let's control D. What I like is this option that uh, lasso selection. So you do something like this and at the moment you let it go, it, it selected everything in it. So I just press delete on my keyboard or delete here. And then the select this one so I can rotate or I can rotate also with the shift. So this is the option here. What I'm looks okay for the rest. I don't want to remove anything. 
I can't now save it in here or what I can do is I can save charges here but what you will see that this one was fully green the, all the tiles were processed and now it says hey one job require update in both data sets and that is the tile that I just changed so now I do submit update override the existing one so if you want to make a different version then you have to make a copy but if I go to more details now I can see it start rerunning only that tile so this goes reasonable quick I think so yeah let's see you wait for the result so the update is now finished and you'll see this tile was done from this 3mix file I can now view it and if everything goes okay the trees are gone so this is really yeah something you should do i think if you have a lot of noise in your model try to clean it up makes it uh, yeah not so much effort and looks way better so this was the session of of a quick workflow of processing data sets so again import create project input images run area triangulation 3d reconstruction and then producing of the model so and if you want to have different type of outputs then make sure that you try to do it under the same reconstruction so it goes just uh, faster thank you If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.